In recent years, our world has been shaken and transformed by the arrival of street art. This is the fastest art movement that's ever happened. I heard someone saying, like, it's more progressive than the Renaissance. Not afraid of controversy, it has become the voice of a generation, reaching out to us on the streets on which we live and having a profound influence on who we are and what we believe. Street art can serve to sway public opinion and get strong political views across. You can stand on a street corner, you can give out people information, but if you create something that they see, then they can maybe better understand it. This film is a story about Ireland in the present day, a snapshot of a nation told through its street art. Ireland committed an act of sodomy, an act of hidden sexuality. Receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Like it or loathe it, street art is here to stay. Art, there's something to be said for art. It's like, you know, like music. <laughs>
And that image was two young men who were in love, who were just holding on and supporting each other. And I think that image uh, maybe just simplified the conversation a little bit. If you put in a ruler line that goes along the top and another ruler line that goes along the bottom, you'll get all of your letters level. Joe also works as a teacher in Tullamore. I'm here and pretend that I'm even halfway interested. My room is a strange place. We could talk about anything. Conversations are always open. Kids can ask anything and seek information on things that you might not be clear on. I think kids nowadays are, are want more information, you know, kind of social media platforms and, you know, kind of the age of the internet has allowed huge amounts of information to be there. I think distilling that information is something they need help with. Like, there's a lot of things that are thrown at kids, like, you know, you, you know, this snowflake generation, Jesus Christ, come in and sit with them. I guarantee anyone that called a kid, you know, a member of the Southern Snowflake generation has absolutely the least inspiring interaction with kids. Kids will blow your mind if you give them the chance to. They're amazing. My classroom in, influences so much of, of, of what I do. Fair play to you. Where, is there any more RDs in the, in the building? Yeah. Where are they? Very rarely I'll take on an issue that I haven't had lived experience of. So of the, the social issues that I've talked about so far, so whether it's mental health, whether it's drug addiction, whether it's equality, I don't believe that I'd have the right standpoint or the correct knowledge or information or even experience if, if I was talking about something that, that I didn't... Um, that I didn't live through. Holly Pereira is an artist based in Dublin. My relationship to Ireland is interesting. My dad is Singaporean, so I'm mixed race. And when I was growing up in the 80s, there wasn't that many mixed race people around. There wasn't many people who were brown. Um, so I have a funny relationship with kind of nationalism and the idea of Irishness. So my relationship with Ireland is interesting. This is Scarlet for your ma for having you, uh, and it's a Dublin phrase um, that you use when you want to like embarrass somebody, I suppose. About two years ago, I got asked to um, be involved in a street art competition, well, a kind of spray painting competition, and I'd never really used spray paints before, and I was very um, a bit blasé about it. I was like, oh, I'm sure it works the same as paint, and then I learned very quickly it doesn't. It's extremely hard to control spray paint, um, but I just kind of caught the bug then. Um, I love spray paint because it's immediate and it's super vibrant colours and it's very fast and dries quickly. After doing that, I just, I love the engagement with the public, um, the idea that your work is on a really big scale um, and the facility to make comments and messages about social issues. Previously, a lot of my work is, or was, strongly feminist. Um, a lot about blood and periods and vaginas. And I wouldn't necessarily put that on a wall. So that's the difference between street art and gallery art, is that you're putting it for public consumption. Nobody has a choice whether to look at it or not, or engage with it. Um, so I don't know, I'm still kind of tussling with that thing of like, do I, do I dampen down? my work to to make it palatable for everybody or should I just go and make it and see what happens and offend somebody maybe but it's a, it's a dichotomy. There's not that many women that I know that do street art and murals and graffiti. It's not that there's a sign saying women can't do this. I think less women are drawn to it but I'd love to see more young women painting walls because essentially if you're doing graffiti, if you're doing street art, if you're doing murals, you're essentially painting pictures on walls. And there's no like biological reason that women can't do that too. And it would be great if more of them did. The recession banged Waterford big style, leaving parts of the city abandoned and neglected. 
Waterford was a city that I suppose had a lot of bad press between high unemployment, crime, but it just seemed that, you know, people just weren't engaged. They just, they kind of, kind of felt nearly like they'd half given up. Hi, uh, are you open today? In 2015, primary school teacher Edel Tobin had a radical idea to transform the city. And do you deliver? My vision at the beginning was get these buildings back, reclaim our streets and start painting them and bring in some colour. The locals were a little bit dubious about what we were doing because they were associating it with, you know, graffiti, vandalism and stuff like that because I was doing um, a schools project here, right here where we are now and an old man came over and he really was not happy with what we were doing. But since then, the locals are, the last over the last five years, they've just gradually been loving it. And people now walking by going, thank you so much for brightening up Waterford. So it's actually changed Waterford, I think. It brings loads of people here, you know, we get the real festival kind of atmosphere going on. It's, it's a bit more it's accessible, really nice. I suppose, to, for art as well, isn't yeah. it? Like, it's not a gallery or something. And it's not just and local people tagging buildings, you know, they're yeah. putting up proper work. It's really nice. Yeah. Yeah, but it's a very progressive idea as well. So, I mean, for a long time, we kind of thought that Waterford was the, the opposite of progressive, I guess. So to actually <laughs> see that they're doing something like this is, is a great sign as well. Yeah, it's good. Today, street art has brought new life to Waterford. One of the most loved pieces to date looks out over the city from the abandoned R3 Hotel. I was looking at that building for three years and I always looked on it as the perfect site to install a drawing because if you've ever been in Rio, you'll, Christ the Redeemer is this, you know, kind of uh, overlooking figure that, that looks down on the city and in a way, mines it. So no matter where you are in the city, you can always see that statue. And it is there as that kind of comforting piece. So I, I like the idea of it, but the figure is outstretched and his head is down and he's been held up. So he's been held up just under his rib cage and then right out at his hands, he's also been held up out here. But the third way he's been supported is he's actually holding himself up. So the piece is about resilience and how a community comes together uh, at a time when somebody may be on their knees or about to fall to their knees, that, you know, you just need to be held up and held in place for that length of time until you can bolster yourself, until you have, can create your own support and can stand on your own feet. And then slowly, you know, kind of that, those hands that need to be wrapped around you are, are moved away. So that piece has been up now for, for two years and has become ingrained or kind of a, you know, kind of just a, a day-to-day -day image that's within the city. The festival has brought new life to Waterford and filled its streets with much-wanted tourists. It's cool that they do the tours and take everybody around because they get to explain like who the artist is and the inspiration for the piece and like whatever they know about it makes it a lot better, I think, for um, people to know what it's about instead of just looking at it. I painted last year, I also painted a tiger at the top of the hill. I'm introducing humans now and I'm, I won't say I'm finding it really tricky, it's just really different. It's got to understand it and the different skin tones and also I mostly paint hair like this and the skin tones is more blending and spraying. Well done. <laughs> They're amazing, they've been bringing me gifts all week. It's been great. I came down from my lift the other day and uh, there was a cold beer and a, burg a, a fresh burger that Ollie made for me and just left it under my lift when I came down at night. <laughs> I think what I like about this one is it's not showing itself off. It's, you discover this one. It doesn't jump at you, mm. you know? Mm. It, yeah, you know, it's a hidden gem around the corner. Um, it is, yeah. Mm. That, that's what I like about it. That's something you did yourself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I did it on computer first. Oh, you then... did it on computer? Yeah. Well, first, this is an actual photo. 
and then I take it to Photoshop and then I paint it all in. I, I assume in. because it is a sort of an African team, is, is that related to your home country? No, not at all. It's not I, at all. No. I immediately, I said, that's it, two and two make five. <laughs> The Monkey Bird crew are from Paris. This is their first year at the festival. En fait, dès qu'on a commencé à travailler ensemble, on a vraiment voulu faire plutôt une identité commune. Voilà, on a choisi ce nom Monkey Bird parce que à la base Louis était intéressé par les oiseaux, moi j'étais intéressé par les singes. Euh, ce qui est intéressant pour nous, c'est que dans notre travail de, de Monkey Bird, on parle beaucoup finalement de notre culture et en, de la culture européenne. I did the DNA test, and actually, I'm about 40% Irish. Listen, if it's controlled, I think it's fantastic if the people that own the buildings don't mind people writing on them. But I think once it gets out of hand, you know, I think it becomes more of an eyesore, and it just kind of looks kind of trashy. It's kind of like litter. Et donc c'était intéressant pour nous de, de rester fidèle à notre imagerie des, des singes et des oiseaux. Il y a une leçon d'humilité finalement dans, dans ce travail qu'on voulait montrer avec le, le château de cartes qui, qui finalement s'écroule. If I had a building and it had a space, I'd love to have an artist come in and paint on the side of it. Because art, there's something to be said for art. It's like, you know, like music. <laughs> Belfast is a city of contrasts, a place where deep social and political divisions spill over at every turn. I am committed an act of sodomy, an act of hidden sexuality. Receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Belfast is a is very unusual city in the sense that it's a city that's clearly transitioning. It's not a city that is fully aware of what it is yet. For decades, artists have explored this identity using the city's walls as a canvas. Today, these iconic murals are a major draw for tourists. It's had a tremendous impact on tourism. For the tourists, they're interested in pictures, they're spiky, they're a bit, you know, they feel that they're doing something a wee bit edgy, going into darkest Belfast and getting pictures of gunmen and things, you know. One of Belfast's most outspoken artists is now recognized as an international pioneer of the street art movement. I liked art. But I didn't ever think I would make a living at it. Or I don't think, uh, really I was too tough to be an artist. Uh, when I say that, I say it with uh, a joke. Because to me, art was for headers. That's what we call them, headers. Like, you know, art. You know, we'd rather be out fighting the Brits. I met my wife uh, at 16 years of age. I was married at 19. And I had a daughter when uh, I was 21, and I was captured uh, in 1981 by uh, the RUC Special Forces. I was captured with, uh, in possession of a, a bomb that I was allegedly driving. I got nine years, a married man with a child on the way, and uh, my daughter, Jura, was 18 months old. The very first piece of art I'd done was um, a bit I used to draw for my daughter. And I would write a letter to my wife. But at the end of every letter, I always done a wee bit for my daughter, Jura. And this would have been the level of the art that I would have done. And it was Wurzel Gummidge. And I get it was Aunt Sally, was it? And uh, my daughter also loved spiders. So I would draw these things for her. Um, I would do these for her. When I went up to the hate blocks and went on the, the, the no work protest, I was locked up 23 hours one day, 24 hours the next day. And you had to do something to keep yourself sane. And what I would do is um, I would paint, uh, draw anything to do with Ireland. 
I used to see the murals and I said, yes, that's the way to go. Because I thought it was a way of breaking through the censorship and demonization of our community. On release from prison, Makara threw himself into mural painting. Mokara came on the scene after the Republican murals had existed for maybe six, seven years. And I think he added something to it that hadn't been there before. Now, there's been a lot like it since and, and other great innovations since, but he made a big, uh, a big input at the time, a big change at the time in the, in the quality and the, and the style of the murals. Working in a conflict zone was dangerous and fraught with difficulty, but it would lead Makara to an innovation that would later become central to street art. We had to, to paint and work fast, but as you know, the, the weather in Ireland cancels all that. So that slowed a lot down. So I thought, sitting one day with a projector, and I said, I wonder what it would be like if you projected a mural onto the wall. So at night, we would use the projector, have it all marked out, and um, we would have it maybe done in a day or two days' time. It is worth pointing out, however, that Mokhara was no lone wolf. He was part of a tradition. Uh, he added to the tradition, but he was part of it. In fact, the, the two traditions that were here. So you've got to see him in the context of lots and lots of other painters on both sides, exploring different ways of getting their messages across. At the time when Mokhara was most active, say in the, in the late 80s and, and 90s, there were many, many other muralists just here in West Belfast alone. We were able to go and put our point of view across our side of the story. A guy who never done any art until I went to prison and then I slowly but surely became an artist. Today Belfast is being transformed by a new breed of street artist who have stamped their mark on the city centre, traditionally the city's only neutral space. The conversation should be about whose city does Belfast belong to? And you have different sort of inclinations, different ideas, if you walk around. The vast majority of these artists avoid the city's politics, with one notable exception. So this is a uh, paste-up that's created by a local artist from Northern Ireland called uh, TLO. TLO is an anonymous artist who has been pasting in Belfast for several years. They are one of the only artists to focus on the North's political problems. And the culture he's specifically talking about here, and he kind of leaves us clues for it, is the culture of unionism. TLO's work can be seen throughout the city centre. Despite speculation in the media, the identity of the artist or artists remains a mystery. I can't speak for him, but my hunch as to why he creates his images is that it seems as though he has a personal kind of um, desire to antagonize the way that culture is understood in Northern Ireland as very much linked to politics, linked to um, the sources of conflict, which brought us into the troubles and, and, and the sense of antagonism that exists today. For all sorts of reasons in this town, there's a chasm between the mural painting tradition and the, and the newer, vibrant street art tradition. And I think that's mainly a political division. And I would argue that to all intents and purposes, they don't influence each other at all. They're two separate developments staring at each other across this little divide, but not actually uh, influencing each other and certainly not copying each other in any way. The conflict in the North isn't the only issue to have divided people on this island. For decades, the issue of abortion has been one of Ireland's biggest battlegrounds. If abortion is a socially responsible act, why do its proponents not want you to see what it looks like? But it was the death in 2012 of Savita Halapanavar that brought the issue back to the fore, leading to one of Ireland's most contentious and hard-fought referendums. And Ireland's street artists were at the heart of the battle. Street art can serve to sway public opinion and get strong political views across. I think it's a very positive thing. The Maser piece on the front of uh, Project Art Centre. The clarity, the graphic uh, punch that it had, and it was uh, really ballsy. 
It was great. Really, really, really good piece. With the repeal the 8th, Andrew Horn, a friend of mine, hit me up a few years ago about designing a logo to put on badges. I thought about it for a while, and then I was like, yeah, OK, I'll, I'll support this and be part of it. And so I designed this badge. And I was like, oh, sure, I've designed this. I can paint it now somewhere if you want. And it was simple as that. We went down and painted it, and we're just like, let's just let, let that sit there and see what happens. And it just took off. Mesa's repeal logo became an on-the-wall emblem for the campaign. The image quickly gained traction and objections and was subsequently taken down. You can take down the mural! You can take down the movement! Leave up the mural! It's taken down then because something to do with, like, Dumb City Council planning. You need to have a plan permission for any murals that go up. So it came down, but... I was grand with it because it was doing its job. Everything lives online nowadays. And so it was spread across online loads. And so coming down only gave it another, another, another voice, another, uh, another chapter to it. So when it came down, it, it, it showcased it even more and people supporting it. But the reason why that piece worked so well was because everyone took ownership of it. So it just becomes a tool for people to voice how they feel. You know, it's just it's an association. The repeal of the eighth referendum was really important. It was a human rights issue, I think. And it was something that was personally really, really important to me that it passed, that it was that it was repealed. I felt so strongly about it, and a lot of my friends and peers also did. It was really important to do that piece because it was a community initiative, and it was on the, it's at a junction, so you know, a lot of cars would pass it and stuff, and it was getting, you know, before May 25th, there was, I wasn't sure that the referendum was going to pass. I thought it was, I didn't know what was going to happen. So it seemed very pressing and very important to make a big statement like that. I wanted to change the visual aspect of the repeal of, of any kind of issue. It's such a heavy, it is and was such a heavy issue and very serious, uh, rightly so, and with a lot of sad, sad stories and a lot of impact. Um, this was a small attempt to bring, not levity, but to bring colour to that in some small way. On the day before the referendum, another young Dublin artist called Aix created a mural that would become one of the most defining images of the campaign. Aix's mural of Civita became a place of pilgrimage for women from across Ireland. Aches did that as a response for his feelings, I don't I think. I don't think he had any plan or any agenda. He just said, I want to paint this, this is important to me. It's showing that I support this cause and I believe in it. And that's what a lot of artists do. You, you would create work as a response. This is what I saw. I'm not sure if this is how it works, but what I saw was that Savita piece and there's two white walls to the sides. A blank canvases then. So people came down, they put down flowers, then other people started doing and people started writing posts, leaving messages. It became just like a message board for everyone. It became a like a like a, a meeting point for people to also express themselves. And that's a beautiful thing about street art and stuff as well, is that it's a shared space. That is the the good power of street art in that basically it's a picture on a wall and then now you've created a community and a space that can go and pay the respects to Savita. So he created this thing out of what was just a hoarding, and that's really amazing power of art. He did a loving gesture to the family of Savita, and uh, the public took ownership over that. And I think that's, that's something very special about public artworks. Subset are an anonymous art collective based in Dublin. We don't identify as individuals because for us, what Subset is, 
what it stands for and what it could be is bigger than any one individual. Therefore, we don't like to identify it one individual because hopefully after the individuals that are involved now, long after we're gone, we hope it will continue. It's a kind of, it's, it's an underground, well, more of a subversive entity. And they're making really powerful work. They're a, a group a little younger than me that survived the recession, that stayed in Ireland, mostly through the recession, that just want to be given an outlet to create. Freedom of expression, what we stand for primarily. More self-confidence, self-belief. That's probably the main thing. Not listening to the people who are telling you you can't do something. Rather, cultivating a group of people who are telling you you can do something. Major street art pieces require the permission of Dublin City Council. And in recent years, Subset have led a campaign to have their regulations relaxed. Everything that we do, we have permission from the proprietor of the building. So we feel, in contest with Dublin City Council's opinion, but we feel that we are completely within our rights to do what we do and how we do it. We don't really accept their authority. So for the people who feel that what we're doing is vandalism, that's okay. And the people who don't feel that way, that's okay too. Dublin City Council a couple of years ago had, uh, had a pretty lax attitude to the painting of large scale artworks. Then a lot, a lot, a lot of commercial work started happening and they had a backlash on that. And I think now there's a dialogue, a very, very positive dialogue uh, happening with the council about how murals can be painted, where they can be painted, for how long they can stay up and all of these things are being teased out. But basically, Dumb City Council are saying less branding, more art and just let the artists have, have their voice. I think this issue has definitely been pulled to and focusing to a point um, with the work that Subset have done and uh, it's been great to to have had a driving force to, to push this issue forward. Some, some at times it might have been a little too pushy in parts but at the same time uh, when you have events like the, the likes of the ones they've had down the Point Village it shows the absolute unbelievable awesome potential of the creative force and talent that they've managed to harness. The Grey Area Exhibition 2 was an event which showcased the work of Subset's artists while also raising money for homelessness in Dublin. They brought 40 contemporary practising artists from the whole island of Ireland together in this amazing space to create work that would raise money for homelessness in, in Dublin City. It's a, a really good cause. They know that they can make a difference, that they know what they're saying is correct. And they have the audience numbers for that was, was huge. You know, there's an audience that, that really wants to engage. I think there's definitely a larger appreciation for it, but I still don't think there's an understanding of just how beneficial it can be as a medium of communication of subjects that really, really matter and need to be spoken about and don't need to be swept under the rug. And artwork in the public realm is a great way of introducing those subjects to people. You can stand on a street corner, you can give out people information and you'll educate them about a particular issue. But if you create something in the middle of the street, something that they have to go around or something that they see, then they can maybe better understand it. It's a quicker route to understanding a particular issue. But right now, Temple Bar, this place is, is rich with a lot of hidden street artwork. And like large scale street artwork too. The largest piece of street art in Ireland is on the walls of a Dublin hotel. The piece was designed and painted by artist James Early and is based on James Joyce's book, Ulysses. The whole project took 12 months. There was three months of uh, just sketching out, of doing research and nine months painting. I looked at the architecture of the building as well and decided to pick out the main characters from the book and have main character panels 
working around the hotel. In between each character, there's linked the themes within the book. My own particular style would be based around stained glass. My family history is within stained glass. They were practicing stained glass artists for over 100 years. So I'm very proud of my heritage. Um, and the style is very much evocative of stained glass, uh, but it's not religious. Uh, it's, 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 uh, there's different themes at play within the work. It was definitely the hardest I've ever worked in in Europe. It was really, really tough. Any wall that I work on now, after that, it's a doddle. I couldn't go near the thing for about a year. I'd avoid walking past blooms. <laughs> But, uh, but now, no, I'm, I'm, I'm still really, really happy with it. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's amazing to have a piece of artwork that large uh, in the city centre. It's, it's, it's a nice feeling. The Waterford Walls Street Art Festival has woven itself into the fabric of the city. The event is drawing to a close with many of the artists finishing their pieces. I sketch with spray paint freehand, uh, all by eye, and for me that's really important to do that. And then it's a question of building up layers of colour all over the whole piece with fat caps um, and sort of, sort of balancing the composition out and then picking bits out, um, uh, drawing bits out with more detail and then knocking bits back um, and kind of balancing the whole piece and then you get to a point where the, all the kind of perspective and the, the balance works perfectly. It's not meant to be like a snapshot, it's meant to be more like, because it's my feeling, the, the emotions I had when I took that photograph, so it's seeing Tokyo through my eyes. So I took that shot, I saw that shot, I took the shot, and it was kind of, it's literally like looking through, someone standing behind me looking through my eyes at that. Um, and it's, I didn't want it to be too precise, so it has got a bit of a kind of diffuse, uh, painty, um, yeah, dreamlike kind of feel to it. So obviously I don't use projectors or anything like that, so uh, I'm just working directly from the reference image. I use, sometimes use kind of little bits of kind of grids and stuff, but it's all, it's all freehand. So um, getting the proportions right is you have to constantly keep adjusting it. So um, it's a lot of work, you know. So um, yeah, it's pretty tough. The reactions have been from you know all ages, from from young kids to to really really kind of. Uh, you know, elderly people, and they've all been like, wow, you know, they've kind of stopped in their tracks and looked at it and, um, you know, kind of been blown away, so that's amazing. And a lot of kind of words like beautiful and stunning, you know, so uh, um, it's been really great, really great, yeah. My work is uh, kind of pure, there's no like political themes or whatever, it's purely kind of aesthetic. It's about uh, creating a kind of positive feeling um, and it's quite kind of spiritual as well. So, um, you know, I create pieces which are quite hypnotizing. So I want people to stand there, stare at it, kind of get lost in it, you know. So it's about people finding their own kind of meanings in my work, you know. So um, it's open to individual interpretation, but um, it's really about kind of creating emotions and feelings through, through colours and lines. Absolutely fantastic. I'm mes mesmerised, I suppose, with the whole lot just can't understand how they can do it or how, I know she stands back and looks at it, but still, I don't know. How doesn't it go crooked or, you know, I know she's done a, a kind of a, an outline first of all, but it's still fantastic. Just even if I come out into the bedroom, I'll just look out at it. It's fantastic because a lot of the house are neglected around here and it is nice to come out and see something bright and colorful to look at. Yeah, so for this piece, um, I came up with this, this story about a human uh, whose personality is split in two. 
So there's uh, the inner child or the, all the, the, the energy and the, yeah, the, the good things, the, the sparkly, bubbling things of life are represented by that little guy. Then the black gigantic bear represents all those things that we don't really control, all that kind of darkness and, and, and things that is, sometimes it can make us feel a, a little bit anxious and bad, but it's still good that it's there, because all of that is actually protecting the little shiny guy. So the idea is that the background blends with the sky. Right. So it really looks like the characters are standing sta there. Yes, oh, yeah. The... You know what I love, and I get, I'm fascinated with it, they're sitting on the box as if the box is actually there oh, and they're sitting yes. on it. Yeah. This is so, so real. Oh, it's nice. very, very good. Thank you, yes, thank yeah. you. Oh, I'm so happy it to really hear that. It really does, as if it's standing out. Yeah. I don't know how you do it, I really don't. <laughs> but if you, can, if you can imagine it, then it's really easy because oh, you no. just have to... I've never tried painting, never tried anything like that. Lovely girl. Really, really nice. Lovely. And she's so young. Uh, goodbye, Grace. Oh, thank you for everything. I love Give me a hug. Lovely meeting you. Thank you so and much. I enjoyed all the time spent with you. It was lovely. I will always remember you. Lovely to see you. Lovely seeing you. And of course, the first thing I thought when I saw the rain come, it's going to wash it off. I know it doesn't, but I still did think that way. I think it's smashing. It's so nice to have it so close. Uh, the, the other thing, I've often seen them downtown and when you walk around the corner and you get a big shock, a big visual shock. I actually saw the whole thing happen, which is completely different. And I'm just gobsmacked at the amount of effort and thought and finesse that went into it. It occurs to me that Sonny paints very like the old masters. Detail is at the heart of what he does. The tape actually didn't come off. Uh, very impressed. And I hope we see a lot more. You can imagine how the city is going to look like in five years' time. Uh, you know, I, I reckon to be buying up houses just to paint them. <laughs> I think it's great. It's a marvellous initiative. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks, Ali. I hope you come back soon. <laughs>
to get in a bit of a head rush. Uh, we couldn't have any flammable material, so we had to get a vinyl that would self-extinguish. So if there ever was a kind of a f issue with fire, we just had to be able to kind of uh, not cause a health and safety issue. Okay. As a, a street artist, to have a piece in the National Gallery is, I don't know, it's kind of, it's, it's strange. It's, it's that, uh, an art form that has, you know, kind of been on the edge and an art form that can be so immediate and, and then can also be removed and, and is only kind of temporary, you know, in its, in its lifespan. And how that has moved from, you know, kind of the 70s of the idea of that it's absolute vandalism into a place where now a piece of art by a street artist is going to be installed in Ireland's premier space for artwork is, um, <laughs> it's kind of daunting in a way. Street art isn't just in the street, and gallery spaces aren't just in the gallery. It's a blurring of those lines. We don't live in a world that's absolute. We live in a world where you need to be able to engage, and you need to be able to kind of lessen something so that something else can, can happen. The, the most fluid and, and important bits of, you know, kind of progression are in the gray areas. Life is partly discovery, and part of that discovery must be through art, too. We discover things about the world, and we discover things about the world when we're ready to see them. Sometimes we need to be on holiday in our heads to see beautiful things. Though now having a global profile, Macer's base remains in Dublin. One of his landmark pieces, You Are Alive, captures much about his ethos. I was coming back from my little cousin's funeral. He died tragically, like the lovely little fella, Richie. And I was just having a little notebook and I was writing notes and I wrote one note saying, You're Alive, avail this once in a lifetime opportunity. We changed it currently to, so get your head out of your phone. And uh, it probably come from us talking to all his mates. And he was definitely like alive in the conversation. And he was like that, so that's just where it came from. Because of its location and the message, it really gets shared a lot. Like in social media there again, responsible for people getting their photos taken in front of every day. And it's just a nice positive message to inject into the city. I think it's, it's nothing too, too clever about it, but that. I'm just still a normal head that eats Zaytun kebabs across the road and goes to the pub and wakes up hungover. Street art, you know, has given me the possibilities and opportunities to live the sort of life I want to live. There's a lot of freedom in it. There's pressures there, but like anyone else, we live in a Western society, monetary game, we've got to make our money. But I have a lot of freedom and I live the life I want to do. I get to travel, I get to meet great people, I get to express this little naggly thing inside me that I have to do. When people call me lucky, that fucking annoys me. Because I, they chose that and I chose this and I didn't have any coaching to tell me. I just went with my gut and said, this is what makes me happy. Sometimes it doesn't, but most of the time it does. So, yeah, I just feel bad when I see people in that rat race coming in, working a job they want to do. I'll meet them for a pint, they're bitching about their woman or their fucking mortgage or whatnot. I'm like, well, you made them choices, or else stop fucking moaning about it and change it. You know, it's never too late to, that sounds cheesy, never too late, but it's so fucking true. Just chop it up and change it if, if you want. So, I'm doing this right now, but if this is to go tits up in two years' time, I will honestly be like, that was a good ride. I fucking, that was good fun. Now get grafting on something else. Or my mind might change, be like, oh, I've just lost a burn to paint. I don't think so, because it's really in me. I know that I can almost foresee what my life is going to be like, and that's a good direction to do that. But, yeah, there's nothing wrong with changing stuff, and never too late to do that. And Yeah, stop moaning. <laughs>